The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, welcome everybody to Ron Book Show on this uh, Friday evening. Friday evening filled with political news all over the place. It's uh, it's like an explosion of news. Whether it's Donald Trump going after social media companies, Twitter, uh, you know, limiting or commenting or restricting. I don't even know what to call it. Um, Donald Trump's tweets whether it's Donald Trump going after China today uh, and, uh, and, of course, China going after Hong Kong and riots in uh, Minneapolis and demonstrations all over the country. And uh, on and on it goes. It seems like it is a... Um, the world is kind of on edge. Things are explosive and it looks like the Trump administration is right in the middle of things. Uh, everything, everything seems to be connected. But before we get to all that, I got a haircut. I hope you like it. Haircut. The world is coming back to normalcy. I actually got a haircut. I, I then, with my wife, went to a restaurant. Not a restaurant that was closed off just for us. A restaurant that had was normal. I mean, it wasn't completely normal. Like the waiters not only wore masks, but they wore these plastic shields over their faces. And you got the menu. The menu was texted to me because you don't want them touching menus and stuff. But it was a restaurant. There were families there, people sitting, people having a good time, good meal, drinking, eating. All right. The world is slowly, slowly coming back to normalcy. Somebody says, be safe. Thank you. I appreciate that. But what does that even mean? I mean, the chance of me getting really sick from coronavirus is small. Um, it's just, you know, you got to live. You got to live. You know, you got to take precautions. Keep your social distancing. Wash your hands. Wear masks when there are lots of people around you. But generally, I'm going to beach tomorrow. I'm going to beach tomorrow. Now, the beach is pretty empty. There's nobody there, but I'm going to go swimming. So, no, I intend to embrace, I've had enough of this, I tend to embrace life and uh, go out there and live and enjoy it and uh, be careful, be careful. There's no reason to take risks that are unnecessary. But on the other hand, look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm still, for a little while longer, a little while longer, I'm under the age of 60 and therefore not in the high risk group. I got one year to go, guys, one year to go, and then I become high risk. Uh, so um, it, is, uh, it is scary stuff getting older. But so far, I might as well take advantage of my la last year on a, uh, on a low risk, in a, in a low risk population group, right? <laughs> anyway, got a haircut, got to go to a restaurant. Life's pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty happy. They're keeping the 25% capacity, but remember, 25% is not 25% of their normal number of, 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 of people in the restaurant. It's 25% of the legal capacity. Often restaurants don't meet their legal capacity. They, they run it under that legal capacity. Legal capacity is how much, the, I guess, the fight upon when it allows you to have in your restaurant. So 25%, I mean, the spacing of the tables, tables were spaced out. No tables close to each other. So it was fine. Um, again, the, the bigger problem in Puerto Rico is that we have a curfew that uh, starts at 7 p.m. So if you're a restaurant, how do you get enough customers for dinner if they all have to be out of there by 7 p.m.? That's the insanity. So I expect the governor to if, either get rid of the curfew completely or to, to move it to 9 p.m., which would make it a lot easier for restaurants to survive. But even 9 Puerto Ricans tend to eat late, like Europeans a little bit, and um, to me it doesn't matter because I eat, my wife and I eat dinner at, I don't know, 5.30, right, 6. So for us it's fine. But 
If they move the curfew to 9 p.m., it'll be a lot better. Hopefully, they can get rid of the curfew completely. I mean, um, I, I mean, wh what's the purpose of the curfew? The cu purpose of the curfew, I think, is two things. One, prevent people from going out and partying late at night. Uh, so bars are closed, but people could party in other venues or at people's houses. And I think the second one is to try to reduce crime. I think it's just an attempt to take the opportunity uh, to exploit the situation to try to get crime out of control in Puerto Rico. Crime is terrible in Puerto Rico, gangs um, and, and uh, drugs and stuff like that. Um, you don't feel it unless you go into the wrong neighborhoods. Generally, I recommend not going to the wrong neighborhoods, whether it's in Puerto Rico or in Los Angeles or in pretty much anywhere else. Um, but... Um, Anyway, it was good. It was good to get a little bit of normalcy. And tomorrow, the beach is going to be fantastic. And uh, yeah, things are going to be good. Uh, let's see. Uh, not sure when I'm going to do show tomorrow. Sometime in the evening, probably, because I'm going to go to the beach, right, in the afternoon. And I've got a, I'm giving a talk, uh, a Zoom talk at 1 o'clock uh, in Italy. I'm giving a talk in Italy tomorrow. Uh, so that, that'll be a lot of fun. All right, I see already, I haven't even started the show, and the Super Chat questions are pouring in. Uh, well, I, I promise I'll get to all of you, but first, let's try to get through some of the topics I want to talk about. And, and, and the biggest topic is, uh, you know, this, this um, fight that Donald Trump is having with Twitter, and, um, uh, you know, t Donald Trump put out two tweets earlier in the week about mailing voting, uh, that encouraging fraud, and Twitter labeled it as misinformation. Because the fact is that there is no evidence, there's no evidence to suggest that mail-in voting is fraudulent. I've used ma mail-in voting uh, when I was in California. I know a lot of people have, many of the people who work for the president have used mail-in voting. I've seen stories about that. It, it, it's just one of these talking points about trying I mean, partially, the president is trying to establish that there is a lot of voter fraud, so if he loses, he can blame the loss on fraud. Um, I mean, that, that, in my view, he's been doing this from day one. He's been doing this from day one when he got elected. It's a Republican talking point. I mean, the last election that was probably decided, a uh, presidential election decided by fraud, was probably the Kennedy-Nixon election, where... Uh, Kennedy probably won that election in 1960 because uh, stories have it that a lot of dead people voted in Chicago and that swayed Illinois towards Kennedy. And I guess it was a very close election and that gave him the election. But even that is, is questionable. But, but the idea that, I mean, study after study after study have shown that, uh, the, I mean, I'm not saying there's no fraud. There's always fraud. But that uh, voter fraud swayed uh, presidential elections in the United States is just untrue and is unlikely to sway it in the future. And I'd be very careful with that claim because if I remember right, Donald Trump won the last elections. So if voter fraud sways elections, maybe it's weighted in his favor. Who knows? Right? Why assume that voter fraud only goes one way? I certainly wouldn't. Although Democrats have been better at it in the past. They have been better at rounding up dead people and rounding up buses and paying people to vote than I think Republicans have. But I'm not sure Republicans haven't improved their capabilities in that regard uh, more recently. Uh, all right, so he, he put out these tweets and they got this disclaimer and man, was he furious. Oh my God, did he get angry. I mean, you can't do that to Donald Trump. You can do that to pretty much anybody else. But you cannot do that to Donald Trump. And of course, immediately, we got an executive order. Right? So, interesting how if Twitter attacks other people, if Twitter discriminates against other people, if Twitter has political bias and it affects other people, that's fine. But when it affects Donald Trump, immediately we get an executive order because the world circulates right here. And the executive order is basically... The executive order is basically that the government that the, that the um, FCC and other branches of the government are going to look carefully at Section 230 of the, of the U.S. Code. Uh, Section Code 230 is Protection of Private Blocking and Screening of Offensive Material, which was passed in 1996. And they're going to look at that and try to weaken 
its protection of internet companies, you know, in order to prevent the ability of internet companies to discriminate politically. Now, there are so many things wrong with this. You're giving the government the power, the ability to decide when internet companies are discriminating. Now, maybe a lot of you are going to cheer this on because, hey, they're going to stop the discrimination against, I don't know, conservatives or pro-capitalists or whatever. I know, you know, YouTube discriminates against me, so maybe I should cheer this on because it'll, it'll, it'll stop discriminating against me. But then what happens when the left gets in and it decides that Twitter, Facebook, whatever is discriminated against them? What are they going to do? Once you open up the Pandora dogs box of letting government decide what constitutes ideological discrimination, you're getting the government involved in what is ideology and what is correct ideology, wrong ideology, appropriate ideology, inappropriate ideology. How much time is given to left, right, center, objectivist, libertarian? Then you are basically eliminating the First Amendment. You're basically getting the government involved in speech. You're getting the government involved in ideas. You're getting the government involved in categorizing what is and is not ideological discrimination. And the government should have no business in doing that. A long, long time ago, there was a fairness doctrine. And the fairness doctrine said that you have to give all voices equal time on the radio and on television. So if you had a liberal, then you had to have a conservative. But, but what about a free market person? And what about a socialist? What about a communist? How do you decide? And what is a conservative and what is a liberal? What is right and what is left? And who gets to decide what is right and what is left? And when does it deviate? And you're giving a government agency, the FCC, the authority to decide. And that's how it was in America for many, many decades. What, how to decide who is what and how much is enough and what is fair and what is not fair in terms of ideological balance. Indeed, when the Furnace Act was eliminated under Ronald Reagan, what's amazing is that conservative radio boomed. Conservative radio because Rush Limbaugh could have never existed under the Fairness Act. Because for every Rush, you would have had to have a lefty. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been balanced. Once the Fairness Act was eliminated, indeed, the, right, the conservatives dominated, became dominant of radio. And talk radio today is dominated by conservatives, or has been for decades. Imagine if you applied these principles of fairness, of balance, to talk radio. You'd have to shut down half the, Repub the, the, the kind of right-wing conservative talk show radios and, and put on, replace them with leftists. Now, nobody would listen to the leftists because there's no market for them, obviously, on talk radio. But the FCC would be required to do that. Now, that is the kind of world we want to create online. The one domain in which it truly is a free-for-all. The FCC should look at whether a tweet was discriminatory or whether Twitter behaved in discriminatory fashion versus conservatives, versus liberals, versus what other. There's just no end to this. No end. Once you give the government that kind of power. And why? Why? Because the President of the United States is offended, a private company said that his tweets were wrong. So, but, but this is being called for, by the way, by both left and right, both Nancy Pelosi and Ted Cruz want to regulate speech on the internet. 
I mean, I said a long time ago, I did a, I did a whole, um, I did a whole show a while ago. I think the title was, we are all China now, right? China won. And I think China won. China is winning. China is winning the cultural war. Not the left, not the right. China is. What are we adopting from China? Well, China's solution to the pandemic was to shut everybody at home, isolate them, keep them at home, not allow for any social interaction for weeks. And I remember when that happened, everybody went, oh, well, you can never do that in America. We have a constitution that protects us. And within a month, what were we doing? We were shutting everybody at home, isolating everybody, criminalizing, walking your dog further than X from your condo building. That's what we did. We copied China's model. The whole Western world, with the exception of Sweden, copied the Chinese model of shutting a city, shutting cities down, shutting economies down, shutting lives down. And then, what do we want to do to our internet? Well, it looks like what we want to do to the internet is give the government control over it. Giving the government uh, the, the, the control over the ideas expressed on the internet. Have them decide what is fair and balanced. Just like Fox, right? Fair and balanced. Now that's China. China controls the internet. And the China authorities, I'm sure, are convinced that they are doing a fair and balanced job. In the common good, by the way, for the public interest to prevent subversive ideas appearing that would undercut the common good and the public interest. Because, don't you know, that is the well-being of the Communist Party is in the public good and the common interest. And anything that undermines it would be would it be bad and therefore must be eliminated? Well, the American government seems to want to do the same thing. Now, it won't start by claiming that everything has to be for the Republican or Democratic Party, but it's not far from that. I mean, after all, it was the tweets of the President of the United States being flagged, which spurred all of this. So what is it that they're trying to undermine? They're trying to undermine the Section 230. It, it, it stuns me, the number of people commenting on Section 230. Has anybody actually read it? Do they know what the context is? Well, this is the context. In 1995, I think there was, there was a book, this is 1995, in the very early days, very, very early days of the internet. And there was a bulletin board in which somebody posted something that turned, that, that was negative information about a particular company. And as a consequence, the stock of that company declined. And the company sued, or a broker sued, another investor, I guess, sued the, not the person who posted the false information, but posted the bulletin board, because it said, you guys posted this, and you curate this. You don't post everything. Some things you won't post. And yet this you posted, therefore you are a publisher, and therefore we want to sue you. And they won. Now here is the dilemma now. If you turn every platform company, every chat, every, every bulletin board on the internet, if you consider every one of them a publisher, then you're going to have significant restrictions in what gets posted. They're going to have to fact check everything. They're going to have to monitor everything. It's going to be almost impossible for them to publish stuff. Now, it's possible they will do it, but then you're limiting what can happen online. And it's not clear they should be a publisher, conceived as a publisher, because the fact is that they didn't write the content. They don't have positive 
content approval, they restrict certain content. But if you don't allow them to restrict that content, if the fact that they restrict certain content turns them automatically into publisher, then you basically cripple the web. This is 1996. There's no Google. There's no YouTube. There's certainly no Twitter or Facebook. I think Zuckerberg is 11 years old. There's barely Yahoo. Maybe Yahoo is just starting out. There's almost nothing. So we're trying to allow for platforms and bulletin boards and think about all the bulletin boards that are around today that think of all the, the I don't know, channel, what is it, channel four, channel eight, channel whatever, that are racist, bigoted, alt-right BS places. Imagine if those were perceived as publishers and could be sued for the content that was there. I mean, they wouldn't exist. They'd be driven out of business. They would be gone. That would be it. The internet as we know it would not exist if we had viewed anybody who restricts certain information and not others. If we turn everyone like that into a publisher. Now, this ruling came to the attention of a couple of congressmen. And they said, you know, one of the problems in this is what if a company that publishes stuff online, what if it restricts pornography? Will that turn them automatically into a publisher? Because they've chosen to restrict certain content, legal content. Pornography is legal. But they've chosen to restrict it. If that turns them into a publisher, then what will happen is some sites will be publishers, and they'll be very small, very limited, and very resource constrained. Other sites will publish everything, including pornography. So he said, that can't be right. And this, by the way, is exactly why we need a Congress. It's exactly why you need a legislature, is when encountering a new technology, we need to clearly define property rights. We need to clearly define how the laws apply to this new technology. So Congress came together and said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to say, you can publish stuff. You can be restrictive in what you publish. And we won't call you a publisher unless you're really a publisher. Now, the law doesn't say this, but what is a publisher? Publisher actually hires reporters. It actually does positive things to the article. It edits them. It promotes certain articles. It, it buys certain articles. It sends reporters to accumulate certain information. It publishes. It doesn't just negatively exclude. It positively includes. It solicits particular materials that it wants. So unless you are explicitly a publisher, we won't consider you a publisher if you're just excluding material. That's what Section 230 does. And here's, here's how it reads, for those of you who've never read it. And there are many I know out there who comment on it all the time. Maybe you should read it. What is Section? So this is under Section 230. I won't read you the whole 230 because it's a long thing. But 235 5C. So No, this is Section C. Section C. Protection for Good Samaritan blocking and screening of offensive material. One, treatment of publisher or speaker. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. It's very clear. Two, civil liability. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of A, any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be obscene, lewd, uh, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable 
whether or not such material is constitutionally protected or b any action taken to enable or make available to information content providers or others the technical means to restrict access to material described in paragraph 1a to, uh, one just paragraph one and it goes on again and it's it's a long section 240 years long and it covers a lot of different things about interactive computer services in other words this is before the idea of platform either even existed right and it differentiates between interactive computer servers which means any means, any information service system or access software provider that provides or enables computer access by multiple users or computer server, including specifically a service or system that provides access to the internet and such systems operated or services offered by libraries or educational institutions. But Facebook and Twitter would qualify. And then it differentiates an information content provider means any person or entity that is responsible in whole or in part for the creation or development of information provided through the internet or any other interactive computer service. Now that's different. They're actually providing information. They're more like a newspaper. They're more like a publisher. So this is good law as far as I can tell. It makes clear differentiation it expands the rule of law into a realm we don't yet understand. It takes away barriers that exist because of old ways of thinking about technology. It's the application of an objective assessment to a new technology. And look what it's spurred. It's created the internet as we know it today. Not a bad thing. Mostly good. And for those of you who think Twitter and Facebook and all these entities are horrible, then stop using them. By the very fact that you use them, you're indicating that you think <laughs> they're good. If you didn't think they were good, you wouldn't use them. Uh, you could be a hypocrite too. Right. Nothing wrong with this. You don't like the way a particular company is using information then don't use that company. There are plenty of alternatives to Twitter. I mean, they might not be particularly popular, but you don't have a God-given right to a popular social media platform. I mean, you don't really have a God-given right to any platform, but you're certainly not a popular one. So go use Gab or go use something else. If you, don't, if you think they're censoring conservatives, fine, don't use them. When people thought Patreon was discriminating against conservatives, a lot of people left Patreon. Fine. And indeed, the attempt now to restrict Twitter's ability to, to filter to be selective in terms of what it allows on its platform or not, what it warns or what it not, is a violation of free speech. They are a private entity, and the government is stepping in, or wants to step in, to say, no, 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 you can't flag the president's tweets. Why not? They want to flag the president's tweets. And if it violates the terms of service, if it's a violation of a contract, then sue them. That's easy. The terms of contract, go sue them. The, the fact is, they're not being sued, and they're not being sued because everybody knows they wouldn't win the lawsuit because the terms of service in a way, are written in a way that they can do these kind of things. Michael asks, what if Twitter removed every tweet posted, said nothing appears on the platform? By the logic of Trump, Ted Cruz, and John, John Hawley, John Hawley has to be the most nasty senator out there, him and Bernie Sanders. Um, by the logic of Trump, Ted Cruz, and John Hawley, he's really dangerous. Twitter then becomes a publisher. It's so absurd. Of course it's absurd. It's nuts. It's their platform. They can delete anything they want. They can flag anything they want. And look, I, I suffer from this. There's no question in my mind. I know exactly when they did it. That in August of last year, YouTube changed their algorithm in ways that restricts viewership of my content. 
I could see it immediately. Subscriptions suddenly plummeted. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. But subscriptions went down. Viewership went down. It's, I've struggled to bring it back up to where it was before. But subscriptions have never gotten back to where they were before. And there's no question the algorithm changed. Dave Rubin told me he noticed the same thing on his platform, at about this, on his channel at about the same time. Okay. If I had an alternative to YouTube, I'd shift. But the fact is, if YouTube doesn't like me, they can do whatever they want. I don't, I don't, they don't owe me anything. Indeed, they're giving me this amazing service. A, a service that I couldn't even imagine 10 years ago. 10 years ago. 10 years ago is nothing. It's yesterday. I couldn't even have imagined 10 years ago. They're giving me this. I don't know how much storage I have there. Gigabytes, terabytes, I don't know. For free. Not only for free. I make money off of it. You know, I made a hundred bucks, I think, today on, on, on Super Chat, at least, off, off of a platform YouTube provides me for free. And you're complaining? Don't like it? Move somewhere else? Do something else. It's stunning to me. Stunning to me. The number of conservatives, the number of so-called objectivists, so-called libertarians, who are clamoring to see the government, the government that we so hate, the government that we so despise when it exceeds the protection of individual rights. They want the government who now they trust suddenly. They trusted to build walls. They trusted to do ideological checks at the border. Now they trusted to do ideological checks online. We trust the government to figure out if Twitter's balanced or not balanced and if it's giving enough time to this point of view or that point of view. Or do we want to take away the 230 restrictions and turn Twitter into a real publisher? And then most of your tweets will never be published. Indeed, Twitter will go out of business. Or they'll publish everything, including pornography, and you won't be able to stop them. And they won't want to stop it because as soon as they stop it, or you could pass a bill that says you can restrict pornography but nothing else. But that won't stand up in the courts because why should pornography be separated from all other content? It's legal content. So it truly is what Trump and all these senators are trying to do is truly insane. Anti the Constitution anti the principles on which this country is founded and destructive to the one area we still have in this country an edge which is the internet you want to give that away i'm sure other countries would love to do it better than us so that's trump and twitter oh and today or yesterday, was it this morning? I can't even keep track. Trump tweeted something about the Minnesota riots. Well, I'll talk about the riots in a minute. Talked about the, the riots in Minnesota. And at the end of the riot, at the end of the tweet, he said, basically said, we're going to take this over. Uh, you know, if, if, the, if Minnesota, the state can't take this, federal government is going to send in troops there. And we're going to stop the looting and start the shooting. So the President of the United States is advocating that it's okay to shoot looters. And Twitter put a warning on it. This is the President of the United States advocating for violence. All right, agree or disagree, their platform. Anyway, Trump has gone ballistic over that as well now. And so has most of the right wing. But let's talk a minute about Minnesota, and then we'll talk about Hong Kong, and again, we'll circle back to Trump's China policy declaration today. So, obviously, I think most of you have seen the video of these four policemen, I mean, four policemen trying to subdue the, the, this uh, suspect, I guess, somebody they placed under arrest. He's handcuffed. 
He's lying on the ground, handcuffed, handcuffed. And this policeman has his, his knee on the guy's neck. The guy's saying, I can't breathe. And he just keeps his knee on the neck. Ultimately, you know, the guy can't breathe, and he dies. He's on the ground. He's handcuffed. There are four of them, four policemen. And they have to kill him? I mean, this is a clear case of police abuse. And I hope there's video of every time this happens, because I, I think it happens more often than we would like to admit. Police killing people when they shouldn't be killed. Police using excessive force on people when they don't need to use excessive force. Now I'm all for if somebody is resisting police using force in order to subdue him. But even then, you, you need a trained police on how to use force that's not deadly. There's plenty of ways to subdue somebody. To, to stop him resisting without killing them or without putting their life in danger. I mean, really, we really need to increase training in this country of police. Now, is, there is a perception that this is related to racism. And that is because the man who died is black. And there is a perception that this happens more often to blacks than it happens to whites. Now, it's true the more blacks are arrested than whites, so I don't know if more, but more proportionate to their population. And that disproportionately blacks are in the criminal justice system. But the question of whether this truly is a consequence of some implicit racism or if this is just a issue of police brutality that had nothing to do with a person's race is a question of fact. It's an empirical question. It's a question for the data. It's a question for investigators. It's a question to figure out what motivated the police to act so stupidly, irrationally, brutally, disproportionately. And they should be prosecuted for it if this is truly negligent. But I do think it is important to figure out, is there a bias in our police force? Now, the response, unfortunately, to this tragic event, I can understand protests. I can understand wanting pe people, wanting their voices heard, particularly people who believe that this is motivated by racism and this is part of a pattern across the country. I, I don't think it's irrational completely for them to, to believe that. I think that they might be wrong, but it's not completely irrational. Again, that's a question of facts and it's a question of empirical evidence. There's certainly, this country has plenty of a history of racism for that not to be completely nuts to believe that at least some of these cases are motivated by racial issues. So I can understand people's frustration and people wanting to demonstrate and people wanting to have their voices heard. But to riot, to burn things down, to destroy private property, to interrupt with the ability of people to go about their daily lives is unbelievably disgusting, irresponsible, and criminal. And people should be prosecuted for doing it. They should not be treated with kid gloves. I don't advocate shooting them, but I don't advocate arresting them and putting them in jail. Destruction of private property is destruction of private property. By the way, destruction of, of a police station, which is what they did last night, is the equivalent to destruction of private property. It should not be allowed. It should not be tolerated. And you need to bring in as many police for, as necessary to stop this. And it's a sign of a breakdown in society when this happens on a regular basis. And unfortunately, you know, this is the first time it's happened in a few years, but... You remember all the riots and demonstrations and destruction of property that happened a few years ago when, again, there was a, a bunch of police killings that seemed to, at the time, target blacks. It also looks like an opportunity 
for sudden activists, sudden out of town, you know, anarchists, or just people who want to see violence in the streets. They, they use these opportunities, they exploit these opportunities to go break stuff. And this is, this has to be brought under control. This has to be stopped. The nice thing to see is that leaders from left and right in at least Minnesota are condemning this. And they need to bring in, the fact that the police abandoned the police station and let them destroy it is pathetic. So while the killing of this man is incredibly tragic and horrible and, and, and just disgusting, this response is completely inappropriate and must be crushed. Not, again, crushed by use of the kind of physical force or kind of shooting that the president is indicating, but just crushed by the proper use of police force. Of course, this is anarchism. I, you know, whenever you see violent gangs battling each other, that's anarchism. The mafia is anarchism. This is what anarchism is. This is the essence of anarchy. And it, anarchism is always a response because it's, it's not a rational standalone ideology. So it's always a response to grievances. It's always a response to grievances by the state. It's a complete breakdown of order. It's a breakdown of civilization. You get anarchy where there's no civilization. You get anarchy where there's no, yeah, civilization is the best word for it. The Middle Ages, yeah. oh, anarchy, bloody in the bloodiest places, you know, some of the bloodiest cultures you've ever lived in. Okay, so well, Trump is right that this needs to be put under control. The President of the United States should never be in a position where he's calling for the shooting of Americans. Even, even those who are violating rights. And by the way, the idea of shooting looters goes against at least a number of cases that the Supreme Court has ruled against. Again, if, if those looters constitute a threat to the police, if the police feel threatened by them, then shooting is legitimate. But the President of the United States should not be threatening this. It's completely inappropriate. And it's the kind of nuttiness that this President exhibits in office and has diminished the value of the presidency. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, the, 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 maybe not the Middle Ages, maybe the Dark Ages, pre-Middle Ages, but Middle Ages as well. All those wars, all those little city-states, all those, you know, slaughters, all that, you know. And if you look at the, by the way, the Middle Ages, or whatever you want to call it, Iceland, which is David Friedman's favorite example of anarchy, yeah, that's the Middle Ages. And that's barbarism, not civilization. And anarchy is statism, because anarchy necessarily leads to statism, because nobody wants to live in a state of anarchy. Nobody wants to live in a state of anarchy. So the people almost always demand, demand a strong man to clean things up. They demand a government to clean things up. Anarchy inevitably must lead to statism and to the worst kind of statism. And it does so primarily because it is a legitimization of might is right. And by leg anarchy legitimizes might is right. And by legitimizing might is right, it legitimizes the rule of the mighty. And again, I, you know, watch my debate on anarchy where I articulate why that is. But, the, you know, by creating competition among entities that provide might, you're legitimizing the idea that the more might you have, the more market power you should have, the more, the more control you should have, the more right you are. And, you know, just think about hostile takeovers, just about any the evolution of any kind of market. If there's a market in force, then over time, 
the guy with a bigger gun is going to be the dominant player. And whether he has good laws or bad laws, whether people like him or hate him, doesn't matter. He's got a big gun, and he's going to subjugate you, and that is the essence of anarchy. All right, um, one other topic I wanted to cover. Yeah, quickly, Hong Kong. Um, China has uh, is now passed a law that basically includes Hong Kong under its security laws agenda. It basically makes all the laws that apply in China that relate to national security now apply in New York, in uh, Hong Kong. <laughs> New York next, I guess. What that means is that Hong Kong is no longer independent, that China can now impose its will on Hong Kong in the name of national security, that it can view all kinds of activities within Hong Kong as threats to the national security of China and legitimately, under the new law, shut them down. It basically delegitimizes the whole idea of two systems, one country, which is never really a legitimate concept to begin with. And it places Hong Kong under, officially now under China's thumb. And in the end, it's the end of Hong Kong. This should be a global day of mourning. One of the great, uh, all right, but Apple is, uh, Apple over the last six months has been a big disappointment to me. It's, you'd think they'd fix these problems and they won't. So China, we're talking about China taking over Hong Kong. This should be a day of mourning. Hong Kong is this great experiment of freedom. What does freedom do? It creates one of the most magnificent cities in human history. It creates amazing amounts of wealth. It creates a population that's innovative, productive, creative, a build, a, 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 a civilization, a culture that builds, creates, makes, that thrives. It shows that capitalism works anywhere. Doesn't just work in Europe, doesn't just work in America. It can be a massive success in Asia. Indeed, Hong Kong got closer to capitalism than any other country, with exception maybe of the United States in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And it appears to be that that experiment is, as of today, over. That China has killed it. That China has basically taken the island over. And that what I hoped when the transition from Britain to China, what I hoped was that Hong Kong would take over China, not the other way around. That will never happen. We are much more likely to see now the decline and death and slow destruction of Hong Kong. And Trump today made a statement about this. Again, more executive orders. Part good, part horrible. Again, he blamed China not for human rights violations, not for the camps in Western China where they indoctrinate and torture and abuse Muslims, not for their treatment of their social media, because <laughs> I think he's a little jealous, not for the lack of free speech, not for the lack of freedom, not for the violation of individual rights. No, he didn't criticize China for that. What he criticized China for is taking our jobs, taking our manufacturing, stealing from us through trade. I mean, there is no end to this man's ignorance of economics, ignorance of trade, ignorance of supply chains, division of labor, economics. He is a mercantilist. He takes us back 200 years to a intellectual framework that is pre-Adam Smith. So unfortunately, anything good he might have done in his accusations against China is undercut, undermined. By the fact that he is, you know, so wrong on trade. So what the United States is doing is the United States today has favored 
in a sense, favored status for Hong Kong in terms of trade, favored status from Hong Kong in terms of technology transfers, uh, favored status of Hong Kong in a variety of different things, and that is all going to go away. So we're going to penalize Hong Kong for what China has done to it. <laughs> what we should be doing is expanding that favored trade to China, and then, as I've argued before, closing our embassy in China, withdrawing any government money that goes to China, withdrawing all sanction from China, declaring China to be an evil regime, and isolating China as much as possible. Not from trade, but politically, diplomatically, in every other respect. We should be encouraging Hong Kong to take over China. But no, that would actually require the President of the United States to have an opinion about a proper regime. That would require the United States to have an actual opinion about individual rights and human rights. No. All our President knows or thinks he knows is about trade, deficits, lack of manufacturing in the United States. So he's penalizing Hong Kong for the evil that is China for the evil and the nastiness that China is committing against Hong Kong. Hong Kong is getting penalized for. Now, I can understand the technology transfer. If you don't want it, the Chinese to have it, don't transfer it to Hong Kong. Of course, that was true yesterday, not just today, given the influence China has in Hong Kong and has had in Hong Kong forever. But why restrict trade? What is exactly that you're hoping to achieve other than to destroy Hong Kong and somehow that'll penalize China. But this is our president, nothing, nothing really unexpected here. It was tough on China, mostly about the wrong things, some right, almost by accident, because somebody told him he should be. No foreign policy, no coherence, no principles, no shining city on a hill, because what are the principles of the shining city? What do we advocate for? What do we believe in? What kind of world do we actually want? So, yeah, I mean, Trump has got all of this wrong. All of this wrong. Shooting protesters, Twitter, and China, he has wrong. I would be much tougher on China in the realm which is the government's responsibility, the political realm, even potentially the military realm by asserting our right to protect the shipping lanes out of Asia. But he wants to play CEO. He wants to play grand poobah of trade, he wants to be a central planner and is not willing to give that up. And as long as he does that, only disaster will follow. Only disaster will follow for us and for the Chinese. Yeah, he'll get his way. China will decline. But so are we. So are we. Yeah, Nicholas has a good quote from Stephen Bannon. He says, Stephen Bannon once said, America is not an ideal. It's just a country with borders. That's what conservatives are coming to. That's what the right has become. Just nationalism. America, nothing special. It's just a country with borders. We happen to be born there. We happen to like it. We want to protect it from other people. No, that's not what America is. It's not what America was. It's not what America should and could be. It's a land of of ideals. It's an ideal. It's a land of individual rights. But you see, they don't believe in individual rights. Steve Bannon doesn't believe in rights. Hawley, this awful senator, doesn't believe in rights. If they believe America is unique in any sense, it's that it's God's country. God's country. That's what makes America special. Not ideas. Not the Declaration of Independence, which they don't understand. Not the Constitution, which they would like to pervert and distort. There's a new, I'll, I'll do a show on this, but there's a new 
movement now to have common good constitutionalism. That is to interpret the Constitution in a way that's consistent with the common good and the public interest from a conservative perspective. None of this originalism crap. None of this individual right stuff. You've got to do what's good for the common good. You've got to do what's good for the nation, for the country. All right, I have like 2,000 questions here, so no more Super Chat questions. Let me try to get to these questions, see how much I can, see how many I can do. If I can't do them all, I'll do them over the weekend. Is there any danger in the government buying up junk bonds like airlines to protect them from going bankrupt? Wouldn't less competition in the industry be a disaster? Absolutely. Well, it's not that less competition in the industry would be a disaster. It depends on how less competition comes about. Sometimes less competition is required. Sometimes less competition is what the market dictates because a business might be a business of economies of scale. But less competition created by government is bad. And bankruptcy doesn't mean companies go out of business. Bankruptcy means they restructure their debt. They restructure their business model. And most companies, well, Chapter 11 is a way to file for bankruptcy, restructure, and then come out as a new company. So nothing, nothing is destroyed. I mean, the assets get reshuffled and some things have to shut down in order for other things to open up. Somebody asked, can Twitter alter and change Trump's tweets because they own them? No, they don't own the tweets. They own the platform on which the tweets are so they can decide whether to publish them or not and they can put warning signs on them. They can't actually change the wording in the tweet. That would be a violation of Trump's property rights. That is the agreement between the platform and the content provider. And that's why the content provider bears the liability associated with content and not the platform. That's the whole point of Section 230 in the law that protects these platforms. Now, is there a danger in government buying up junk bonds? Yes, huge danger. And that is that the government starts picking winners and losers, that the government starts intervening in financial markets in ways that prevent companies from going bankrupt when they should go bankrupt, that saves companies. Now, the government has been doing this since the 80s. Ronald Reagan did it when he bailed out Chrysler in the 1980s. George Bush did it, and then Obama did it in bailing out the auto industry in the 2000s. Obama did it particularly badly because the government took an equity position, stock, in General Motors, which is socialism, the government owning the means of production. Now, it wasn't a controlling interest, but it still was a big move towards socialism, fascism. But again, bailouts of automobile companies go back to Ronald Reagan. Government should stay out of economics, out of business, out of the markets. If companies go bankrupt, let them go bankrupt. And of course, through the Federal Reserve, the government has been manipulating interest rates in a way that allow what we call zombie companies, companies that are basically dead, to raise debt much cheaper than they would otherwise, which allows them to stay alive in spite of the fact that they're really dead. Zombies, the living dead. That's what these companies are. Does Europe do criminal justice better than we do? Half our prison population are nonviolent drug offenders. Europe, European prisons are more humane and only have 20% re recidivism rates as opposed to our 70%. I mean, the issues in Europe are very different than the United States, but let me say this. I mean, American criminal justice system is a disaster. The fact that we have so many people in our, in our uh, prisons for non you know, non-victim crimes like drugs, drug possession, even drug trading is a non-victimless crime, is a victimless crime. There's no victim. I mean, I would decriminalize at the least, legalize at best all drugs. Certainly wouldn't send anybody to jail for possession or even for trade, for selling. It is a disaster what our prisons have today, the number of people in our prisons today that are there for, for crimes that have no victim. Whether it's prostitution, what's, who's the victim in prostitution? 
And there are a lot of corporate laws that are completely victimless, that are completely arbitrary, that completely constitute power grabs by the government, where people are sitting in jail for nothing. So laws in America are way too expansive. And we are, we are far too quick to pull the trigger on putting somebody in jail. I don't know much about the criminal justice system in Europe. And I don't, I'm not big on humane prisons. If you commit a violent crime, I don't want to treat you humanely. But the fact is recidivism rates in the U.S. are very high. The fact is that we put in jail many, many millions of people who should not be in jail. The fact is that the American criminal system, justice system, is broken. And it needs to be completely and utterly reformed, just as so many other things need to be reformed. And again, I think part of this plays into the frustration, the anger that exists among certain populations in the United States, in certain neighborhoods in the United States, where a huge percentage of the male population is in jail. It's a disgrace, and I wish somebody would change it, but it doesn't look like anybody will change it. Derek again asked about Twitter, so I'll, I'll answer it because it's about... No, they cannot, they shouldn't be allowed to change Trump's tweet. Uh, now, again, I don't know what the terms of services are, but I'm pretty sure that the terms of service say that they can't change that. If they have deleted or changed a paragraph in somebody like Trump's tweet, then they're probably in a violation of the terms of service and should be sued. But it's not criminal, it should be sued. The person who owns the tweet should sue them. Um, but I'd be surprised if they changed it. I mean, I'd like to see the evidence that Twitter has actually changed somebody's tweet. Not blocked it, not put a label on it, but actually changed the text. I haven't seen evidence of that. And if it is, then sue them. I mean, th th we have a, a legal system that is pretty good about these things. You violate a contract, you, 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 you do things you're not supposed to do, then go after them. Pretty straightforward. In the future, will technology or medication allow us to experience happiness without having to achieve values? No. No. Happiness is not a state of a sudden amount of chemicals bouncing around in our brains. Happiness is a state that results from achieving one's values that has, as part of that, an expression in chemicals. But it's not clear that all of it is. And it's over long periods of time. It's your entire life. And it's conscious. You, you know it. So if you feel it, but you haven't achieved the values, what you'd feel is alienated from yourself. You'd have a chemical response in the brain that you did not recognize, did not identify as linked to anything. The brain is not, I mean, human consciousness and the human mind is not just the chemicals. That's why you cannot create just a happiness state by using drugs. All drugs should be legal. Medication drugs, recreational drugs, all drugs should be legal. And let people choose. They want to commit suicide, everybody has a right to commit suicide. They want to use them to get high, everybody has a right to get high. You want to not use them, don't use them. Prices would drop. Violence would decline by, I don't know, 70% at least. Dangerous drugs, don't use them. They're dangerous. I don't use dangerous drugs. You shouldn't use dangerous drugs. Somebody wants to use dangerous drugs. Why is that any of your business? Guns are dangerous. Knives are dangerous. Life is dangerous. You got to live. And you got to let people do stupid things. In order, not for the purpose of letting them do stupid things, but in order to let good people do good things. Freedom is freedom. You don't get to decide. What are the boundaries of freedom? As long as I'm not violating your rights, as long as I'm not 
infringing on your property, as long as I'm not doing harm to you. Why is it any of your business? What I consume in my own home. Hey, Yohan wanted to clear up my hot 25-year-old comment. I don't know what that is. I, 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 it wasn't a gotcha question. I'm just having a hard time differentiating between long-term selfish behavior versus pursuit of pleasure. Big fan and keep up the great work. Well, pursuit of pleasure is part of long-term selfish behavior. But pursuit of pleasure in the moment can't, it's just one value. It has to be weighed against other values. And I'm not against pleasure. I'm hugely for pleasure. And dude, your pursuit of value should be pleasurable, at least part of the time. And your wife, in, in your family life, you should get pleasure from your wife. And you should give her pleasure. It's part of having a life together. The question is, where does any particular pleasure, where, does that, where is that in the context of your hierarchy of values? And the hot 25-year-old going, you know, some hot 25-year-old and, in a sense, giving up on your family, nobody thinks in terms of values, in terms of what's really important to you, nobody thinks the hot 25-year-old is more important than your family. Nobody. Now, some people go with a hot 25-year-old because they don't think. They don't have a hierarchy of values. They haven't thought in those terms. And they're impulsive and they just do the pleasure of the moment. But anybody who thinks, anybody who creates a hierarchy, anybody who thinks in values, realizes very quickly some things are more important than other things. The hot 25-year-old might be pleasure in the moment, but this is a lifelong commitment relationship and the pleasure is far greater over the long run. So I'm never going to be tempted by this 25-year-old because it's so low on my hierarchy of values, that kind of pleasure, relative to the pleasure of having a long-term relationship, that it's, it doesn't even cross my mind to go after the 20. I might look at the 25-year-old and go, wow, she's hot. I'll usually turn to my wife and say, wow, she's hot. My wife will say, yeah, she is. Um, but that's, but I'm never tempted to actually do anything about that. Because it's my high care values is a high care values, which means the things I want, I know what I want and I know what I don't want. Some things I don't want because I figured it out. I figured my high care. So, don't deny pleasure. Nothing I said should say pleasure's no good. It's the kind of pleasure, the context of the pleasure. You know, and there might come a time where you don't want a family. This is why divorce happens, right? <laughs> Derek is still single and he wants the introduction to the hot 25-year-olds. They're at any bar. They just go into a bar, and there they are. So, you know, there's plenty of them. So there's no shortage of hot 25-year-olds if that's what you want. If that's what you want, right? Any, any bar, late at night, hotel, major city, you can find them. But it's, it's not to deny pleasure that you deny going with the 25-year-old. It's to recognize a much greater pleasure, a much greater value, much greater happiness. You're always trading off values. You're always choosing to do with your time X rather than Y. Why? Because X long term is better for you than Y. I mean, if you're rational. And all I'm saying is, the hot 25-year-old doesn't appeal to me because Y over here is much more interesting much better for me, much more pleasurable, and much more valuable long-term. <laughs> now the chat has become a discussion place about where are the best bars to pick up hot 25-year-olds. 
In the movie, Other People's Money, do you think, La- do you think Larry the Liquidator character was portrayed in a buffoon manner undercutting his brilliant speech? Yeah. Well, not just a brilliant speech. The whole movie, he's brilliant. Everything he does and almost everything he says is brilliant. Right on. 100% consistent. Even the love scenes are right on. But he's portrayed as a buffoon because it's Danny DeVito. And that's clearly to undercut his character, yes. So while, and this is why the movie's not a, you know, could be a perfect movie. It's not perfect because there is definitely the undercutting of his greatness by casting Danny DeVito and casting on the other side, Gregory Peck. Now part of that is, is good effect because the Gregory Peck character, you want to sympathize with him because he's Gregory Peck, but he's wrong, so it creates a certain cognitive dissonance. And Danny DeVito character, you, you don't like him, but he's right. Creates some, so there's a certain appeal to that. But I think ultimately the motivation is to undercut him, yes. What is the objective free market view of companies using conflict, co- conflict minerals or including things in their products that are derived from slave labor? I mean, I think it's wrong to do, but in the world in which we live to some extent, it's inevitable. That is, there are certain minerals that cannot be procured. They just don't exist anywhere else. Now, <laughs> I'm going to say something super, super crazy, but I think it's true. I think it would be legitimate for these companies to hire mercenaries and to go into some of these countries and to take over the mines and get rid of the slave owner the slavery and to actually have real wage laborers do the same work now can you imagine what would happen can you imagine the uproar can you imagine the outrage but indeed colonialism did that now it was abused Primarily Belgium colonialism and others were abusive. The British colonialists sometimes abused us, sometimes didn't. But imagine if these corporations don't want slave laborers. They're mostly run by moral, decent human beings who don't want to buy stuff from slaves. But they can't access the material otherwise. The governments in these countries are completely corrupt or don't exist, like in the Congo. Ideally, they would colonize in a sense they would take over these places they might even finance a coup to replace the government to a stronger government that could take control over those parts of the country and get rid of that slave labor or, or, or whatever's going on there but imagine imagine mercenaries would be legal outside the united states not within the borders but imagine how they would be treated today if they did that But yet, the situation would be a lot better for those people who are today treated like slaves. The sad circumstances are that some minerals out of Africa cannot be, you can't access them anywhere else other than these places, and that the local governments are too weak to enforce any kind of property rights or any kind of rules or any kind of behavior, and therefore criminal gangs control these mines. And these companies have no other way to access these kind of materials but to buy it from them. That is horrific but they really have no alternative given the world in which we live. And it's sad, but it's not because of the corporations. It's because these countries and the shape they're in. Let's be honest, in 20 years, we'll all be in Venezuela. We can't stop it. We can stop it. The real question is, will we? But there's no question in my mind, we can stop it. Is it immoral to study from pirated copies of books? Yes, it is. If you've got an option, any kind of option, if the books are available, then you shouldn't use pirated books. You're stealing. That would say, like, is it immoral to listen to pirated music? Is it immoral to steal my neighbor's car and drive around? Is it immoral to drive in pirated automobiles? Is it immoral to use pirated money? Just replace pirated with stolen and you get your answer. Do Democrats view blacks as kept pets? 
Well, not as kept past, but they take blacks for granted. They assume that blacks will always vote for them because they always have. And, and um, luckily for Democrats, Republicans tend to be bigoted, tend to be um, in certain states, in certain areas, tend to be bigoted, tend to be intolerant, tend to be, tend to be just horrible towards minorities. And they, the Republicans make no effort to go after minorities. So luckily for Democrats, blacks don't have many choices. It's like, elite, it's like immigrants. You know, Mexican immigrants should be Republicans. They're Catholic. They take the religion seriously. They're socially conservative. They generally came to this country because they want more freedom, not less. They came to this country to, ex to, to, to escape authoritarian regimes elsewhere. And the Republicans make them feel unwelcome, make them feel like criminals. They prosecute them, criminalize them. They, they, they go after them in any way that they can. They, they say horrible things about their, their people, about their, their cousins, their family members. Uh, and it comes from the top. It comes from people like Donald Trump on down. So there's no chance that these people are going to vote Republican. And then they, you know, so it's Republican failure that guarantees blacks and Hispanics will vote Democrat. Republicans are to blame. That's why Republicans in Texas get a lot more Hispanic votes than Republicans in California, because Republicans in California alienated through their policies and through their advocacy, they make the, you know, the immigrants in California. And in Texas, they didn't do it as much. So many more Hispanics vote Republican in Texas than they do in California. Why did Richard Spencer say Ayn Rand was, an, was autistic? Why would I comment on anything Richard Spencer says? I mean, the guy is a racist nut. So what does he know? What does he know and why should anybody take anything the, you know, the, 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 the I don't know, I'm not going to call him names, says? Anything. He's a racist. He's a, he's a, uh, he has nothing of value to say. Nothing. So I wouldn't comment on anything, he says. As a Latin American future immigrant, which is better to immigrate, U.S. or New Zealand? Which has more future for free people? That's hard to tell. I mean, I love New Zealand. It's a great country, but it's small. It's limited in opportunities. Australia might be better in that sense. It is freer than the United States on, on most economic freedom indexes. But America is still, the United States is still where you have the most opportunities. It's declining, so who knows? But the universe of good places to emigrate to in the world is shrinking. And that's sad for people like you who want a better life, who want to leave their country, who want to go somewhere where they have more opportunities. There was a recent five, uh, May 11th case of potential voter fraud in Patterson, New Jersey. Hundreds of mail-in ballots found in mailboxes. But it's still being shown to be mostly a myth. Yeah, I mean, there's always fraud. There's always some fraud. There's fraud with regular voting. There's fraud with mail-in voting. There's fraud with all kinds of voting. Military votes, all kinds of voting. There's fraud. The question is, how big is it? And, and, and this is a good case because it was caught. And I think most of it is caught. I just don't think fraud in the election is that big of an issue. Not to say it's the zero issue. It's just not that big of an issue. All right, uh, but thanks for the example and for the fact that it's not, it's been shown. The Brennan report, the are, there are other reports that have shown that it's not a big issue. Trump reminds me of the movie Mean Girls. Anyway, YB, remind people to subscribe. Yeah, subscribe, please, everybody subscribe. Even if they watch, any, even if they watch anyway, because of, our, yeah, subscribe, it helps algorithms. It gets more people, and don't forget to like. Like helps algorithms, subscribe get, it really helps algorithms, and more than anything else, sharing helps the algorithm. Share, share, share. I know it's tough. I know you don't like doing it. It exposes you to all your friends and family members. It exposes them to me, which is scary for you. But share. If you like a segment, if you like a video, if you like a whole thing, share it. That helps the most on the algorithm thing. That is subscribers. So please 
we need to get to 20,000 quickly here. We're at like at 18.9 or something, 18.8, uh, 18.9. We need to get to 20,000 and then 100, right? But it would be cool if we got to, if we got to 20,000 by the end of June. That would be really cool. Unlikely, but it depends on you, right? All right. How do the intellectuals convince non-racist white people to feel responsible for racism that they haven't perpetrated? How do they convince them? Well, it's easy. It's easy. Because we're taught that people are flawed. We're taught original sin. We're taught that we're all sinners. And then it's just a question of what sin did you commit? Well, even if you didn't commit, by association you might have committed it. People are looking for things they should feel guilty about because their religion teaches them they should feel guilty about stuff. And I'll go find it. And one of the things you can feel guilty about is your neighbor's racism. And people do feel guilty about that. And it's very easy to intellectuals to bring that up. And in a world of collectivism, in a world where we are brother's keeper, in a world where the tribe matters, and in a world where right and left thinks that the tribe, part of the tribe is the color of your skin, that that matters. Blacks are blacks, whites are whites. Then you are part of a tribe who a significant number of its members are racist. You should feel guilty. Just like you take pride in the achievements of white people, well, you should then feel guilty for their sins. That's how people think. That's tribalism, collectivism, makes it possible for people to take on the guilt of, uh, uh, of, of the bad actions of other people because they belong to the same tribe as I do. And look, there's a lot of racism in America. And suddenly, there's a huge history of racism in America. But the only way I can say, well, I didn't do it, so I'm not a racist, and I didn't do it, so I don't feel any guilt, is to be an individual. But we're taught from when we're little to be collectivists, to take pride in their achievements and therefore take guilt in their sins. We belong to the tribe. That, this is part of the danger of tribalism, of collectivism. What if Twitter removed every tweet posted? So, oh, we, we talked about this. We did that already. Uh, Josh Hawley, one of my least favorite senators, Democrat or Republican. He is a Republican, evil, evil ideas. Josh Hawley is one of the worst of the new right, absolutely. Power-lusting anti-intellectual, absolutely. Yet Ivy League educated, yes. If Trump wins, Hawley's brand is emboldened, absolutely. And it's much more than Hawley, it's the whole new right, which we'll talk about more. I've talked about quite a bit in the past, but there's, I've got a whole new bunch of stuff on the new right. And, and Brad Thompson has done some recent essays on the new right uh, that are definitely worth reading. And we'll talk about that. I want to interview Brad on it, and I want to do a bunch of shows on the new right, because I hate, hate the nationalist conservatives and the alt-right and all the different variations of the new right. There's a bunch of different, but they're all collectivist, and they're all ugly. Ugly. Aesthetics matter. And their ideas are ugly ideas. All right. We're almost done. Did you hear about the CNN reporter who was arrested on the scene at the riots uh, on live TV while broadcasting this video? And do you think the police who arrested them were emboldened by Trump's attack on the media? I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know. You'd have to get the... But, it, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if people really attacked the media. Trump has basically, you know, said the media is open game. But, but I don't know the details. So in this case, I'm going to hold my judgment until I read up more about it. My brother is a cop. The mentality of cops is very much there's us, cops, and there's everyone else, civilians. Well, I think that's sad if that's a mentality. And again, I, I think there's a lot of bad training that goes on in the police academies. 
I think there's a lot of negligent training that goes on. I mean, cops should be taught that they are the servants of, the, of everybody else, of civilians. They're there to serve. They're there to protect. That's the fundamental. Now, the whole function of police has been corrupted by the war on drugs, by the war on a victimless crime. Nothing has done more harm to the morale, to the steadfastness, to the trust, to the uncorruptedness of the police than the war on drugs. The war on drugs have made policemen bad guys. They've made them corrupt. They've made them be seduced by money because they have to enforce non-objective laws, they have to enforce victimless laws, and they're tempted by, co by, by all the money that's involved in it. So, yeah, you can see that in The Wire. The Wire is a great show to see how difficult it is to be a cop not just because of the world in which you have to inhabit, but because of the drug war. The drug war makes everything much worse. I have never said white people are racist. I said some white people are racist, some black people are racist, some Hispanic people are racist, some non-identifiable color people are racist. I've never said white people are racist. Not in my vocabulary. I don't even think in those terms. I don't think in terms of white and black. Never have. Every time people point this stuff out to me, I go, what are you talking about? Who cares? White, black, green, yellow. Makes zero difference. Can Twitter alter the president's car? No, it can't. To what extent? Okay, uh, here's a question. Complicated question. Don't know if I can answer it fully now. To what extent, how should Americans' rights be protected abroad? <sighs> It's a complicated answer. So here's an outline. And I've talked about this in the past. I said America should categorize countries by the extent to which those countries protect individual rights. If a country does not protect individual rights at all, the United States should have no diplomatic relations in that country. And it should warn American citizens that their rights will probably not be protected in that country, and that buyer, traveler beware, trader beware, that the US government will not intervene on their behalf because the US government has no embassy, has no relationship, does not sanction or, or uh, acknowledge these governments because they are authoritarian governments that violate individual rights. So you can still trade with them at your own risk. If they don't pay, good luck collecting. The US government should protect the rights of Americans when they travel to countries that the United States has diplomatic relations with. Or if an American citizen is kidnapped, let's say from a country that has diplomatic relations with the United States to another country that hasn't, then the United States would intervene in that country's affairs. But the U.S. should only protect Americans' rights, I guess, in two circumstances. One, where it's a country that is a rights-protecting country. So an American in Paris, the American government should intervene to protect him if there's a danger of his rights being violated. An American in North Korea is on his own putty. Don't put yourself in a position where you're caught by no North Koreans. If you are... No American is going to risk his life to protect you. It's on you. If you're in a country with no government, an anarchy, an open country like in the Congo, or, yeah, I mean, the American government would send in and, and protect you and defend you. The same thing with property. You know, if, 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 it's, if, you're, if you think you have property in China, you don't. There's no property rights protection in China. And the American government cannot protect your property in China. 
But in a no man's land, like the Arabian Peninsula, when American oil companies dug for oil there, then yeah, the American government should have protected their rights, their property rights. But let me just say, this is a complicated issue. It's a complex issue. We'd have to go through a lot of steps to get to my final conclusion here. And we don't have the time because it's already way past an hour and a half. So we're going to cut it short there. I'm going to again remind you to support the show, yvonnebookshow.com slash support. Really appreciate it. Of course, I appreciate very much the super chat that you have done um, and, and all the, the support I get through super chat. There are a lot of different ways in which people support the show, and that's amazing. Um, I particularly value the people who do regular payments on like a PayPal because then I can know exactly how much money is going to come in next month. Uh, super chats are a little trickier. Some shows generate a lot. Some don't. Uh, so the, the regular payment is easier. But, hey, I'll take any generous support that you guys can provide. So thank you for that. And, again, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. All right. I'll be back tomorrow, probably evening, after the beach. And uh, we will be doing more Super Chats. So please use the Super Chat. It's great. And, um, yeah, I'll see you guys all tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed the show.